wait a few seconds here before, uh, just in case anyone's entering the room. Alrighty then. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, today's event is called A Background on the Criminalization of HIV in Canada. Uh, my name is Sierra Mateo. I am a 3L student at the Schubert School of Law and the current co-chair of the Dalhousie Criminal Law Students Association. Uh, today's event was put together by both the Criminal Justice Coalition um, and the DCLSA, uh, the Student Association. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Here today and every day, we are all treaty people. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, Megan Longley, our third panelist today, uh, could no longer join us, uh, but we're still very, very happy to be joined by both Richard Elliott and Alexander McClellan today. Um, so as you saw from our promotional material, Richard served as executive director of the HIV Legal Network from 2007 to 2021. Um, and his current work um, is as a consultant, focusing his efforts on HIV, health and human rights. Um, Alex as well as a professor at Carleton University. Um, and he had the exciting opportunity to present his research findings on the criminalization of HIV non-disclosure as an expert witness to the House of Commons. Uh, the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Um, so thank you both so much for joining us. Um, it's unfortunate that Megan couldn't be here, but um, we do wish her the best today. Um, for anyone joining us in the audience, um, if you have a question that comes up during the event, please feel free just to put it in uh, the chat at the bottom of your screen there. Um, and I will be monitoring the questions and then closer to the end, um, I will be uh, just posing those questions to the group. So that's it for me. Um, I will hand it over to the experts now. Great. Thanks, Sierra. I think I'm going to kick things off. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. And I'm glad that Alex could join this discussion as well, because he's done some of the groundbreaking research in Canada on the harms of HIV criminalization to people living with HIV, along with a lot of other stuff. So it'll be really important to hear that in our discussion. He had said that I would kick things off with a bit of an overview about the state of the law related to HIV criminalization in Canada, and then also speak a little bit about some of the advocacy efforts to date to address the state of the law, which gives rise to uh, a number of concerns. So I want to speak to both of those uh, in that order. <clears throat> so first of all, um, for those who are not familiar with the issue, uh, just to let you know that since the first recorded prosecution in Canada for alleged HIV non-disclosure to a sexual partner, and that's mostly what we're talking about in Canada when we're talking about HIV criminalization, um, but it's not entirely, there have been, to our knowledge, 224 prosecutions to date. Um, Canada used to be amongst the uh, world leaders in the number, and I put that term in quotes, uh, in terms of prosecuting people with HIV alleged non-disclosure. Uh, unfortunately, the situation we have learned in a number of other countries has actually gotten worse. Um, and that is the reason that Canada is no longer in the top five, um, but it's hardly a group in which we want to be. Uh, there is more information about uh, the details of those prosecutions and some of the trends and patterns, including demographics, uh, in a document that I'll share a link to later in the chat that the Legal Network has produced. But uh, it's a significant resort to the use of the criminal law. And I think it's worth also noting that while the law I'm about to outline, in theory, uh, applies to other sexually transmitted infections, or at least some of them, and there have been uh, a few cases in relation to some other sexually transmitted infections. The overwhelming majority of the cases of the use of the criminal law uh, to deal with these allegations of, of not disclosing a sexually transmitted infection have been in relation to, to people with HIV for alleged HIV non-disclosure. Now, there is no specific offense in our criminal code that deals with not disclosing or transmitting uh, HIV or another sexually transmitted infection to a sexual partner or possibly in other circumstances. And so the way the law has evolved has been through the decisions of first prosecutors and then subsequently courts 
in uh, deciding to lay charges and then in the interpreting and application of those charges under other offenses that are already found in the criminal code. So offenses of general application, uh, offenses such as common nuisance, administering a noxious thing, criminal negligence causing bodily harm or causing death, depending on the uh, circumstances that are alleged. And most particularly, especially since the late 90s, uh, charges of assault or a particular sexual assault, and specifically, most often, the charge of aggravated sexual assault with serious form of sexual assault, as people will know, in the criminal code. Uh, there was a lot of throwing different things at the wall and seeing what would stick by prosecutors and courts and uh, conflicting outcomes in the first a decade or so of resort to using criminal charges in cases where people are accused of not having disclosed their status to a sexual partner. Um, in most cases, uh, in most of those cases, I should note, there uh, was no transmission or no allegation of actual transmission. The majority of cases in which people have been prosecuted uh, have not involved actual transmission. They've involved allegations of exposing a partner to a risk of acquiring HIV that is perceived by prosecutors and police and the courts to be too high in their view. So that's one important thing to remember. But since the late 90s, as I mentioned, uh, the main charge that has been laid against people has been the charge of aggravated sexual assault. And that follows a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in a case called Courier, which was the first case on this subject. And it established the basic legal framework that has since been applied in the vast majority of cases. And the gist of the decision was that the Supreme Court uh, said in a split decision that in some circumstances, not disclosing uh, HIV or another sexually transmitted infection uh, could amount to fraud that would vitiate a sexual partner's consent to sex. And as people will perhaps know, under Section 265 of the Criminal Code, uh, consent can be rendered invalid in law. Consent to sexual activity can be rendered invalid in law in a variety of ways, and fraud is one of those. So the Supreme Court affirmed that in some cases, not in every case, but in some cases, not disclosing that you have HIV to a sexual partner would amount to such a fraud. Therefore, what was otherwise a consensual sexual encounter is in law a sexual assault. The court also said, without much consideration of this, that it would meet the requirements for the offense of aggravated sexual assault because there would be, in its view, endangerment of life. And that's one of the ways in which a sexual assault or an assault is elevated to an aggravated status. Um, the court was clear in that case that there was not a blanket obligation to disclose. That was a central point in the case. Uh, but rather, they said that the duty to disclose will arise when there is a significant risk of serious bodily harm. That's the key phrase from the courier decision. That's the threshold. They, excuse me, a majority of the court in that case, and this is relevant for how things evolve later, uh, said that uh, something like uh, condom use uh, may, or in the case of a minority concurring judgment on the part of some judges, including now Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, would in fact prevent there from being a significant risk of transmission. And so in, in that circumstance, uh, according to the majority, you may not have a duty to disclose. According to one of the concurring minority judgments, you would not have a duty to disclose. Um, and uh, so, so there was a clear recognition from the beginning that there was a need to not cast the net of criminalization too widely, that mere non-disclosure should not in and of itself be a criminal offense. There had to be a certain level of risk and a certain level of potential harm associated with that risk in order to trigger the application of the criminal law. So fast forward from there to uh, another key case in this area from the Supreme Court of Canada in 2014, a decision called Mabior. Uh, in that case, the Supreme Court of Canada affirmed the basic legal framework that they had set out in Courier and went on to clarify, in their words, that this significant risk of serious bodily harm would, in the specific case of HIV, be met if there was a, quote, realistic ability of transmitting HIV. So that is the key uh, HIV-specific updated formulation of the legal test, if you will. So. Uh, and they they did that because there had been a lot of criticism uh, about how the 
court, the courier test had been interpreted and applied in, by lower courts and by prosecutors. There had been a lot of uncertainty, and there had been, importantly, developments in the scientific knowledge about HIV, uh, including factors associated with uh, possibility of transmission or not. Uh, including, for example, uh, significant new developments in the evidence base about the relationship between the viral load that someone has and the possibility of transmitting through sexual activity to a sexual partner. And uh, so there was a need a seen on the part of the court to revisit to some degree uh, what the, fra the, the law should be, but they affirmed the basic legal framework and uh, recast the significant risk of serious bodily harm test in the HIV context as a realistic possibility of HIV transmission test. So that's the key phrase for HIV. Keep in mind that the overall framework uh, is still, if there is a significant risk of serious bodily harm, then a duty to disclose uh, would arise. And that could apply not just to HIV, but potentially to certain other sexually transmitted infections. I note that because it's relevant, of course, to some of the ongoing advocacy that is currently underway. Uh, the, now, one of the significant problems, and there are others that we can speak about, is how this test, this legal test, has actually been interpreted and applied by police, by prosecutors, and by courts who have these cases brought before them to adjudicate and are required to apply the legal test, uh, at least the lower courts, are required to apply the legal test that the Supreme Court of Canada has articulated. Uh, and what we were seeing, uh, that the, interp the interpretation and the application of the criminal law and this particular test has been very, very broad. And that's given rise to obviously a whole bunch of concerns. There are some inherent harms in turning to the criminal law to deal with HIV transmission or exposure. Uh, but of course, those harms are magnified the broader you cast the net, right? And uh, the net has been cast quite widely in Canadian law, uh, unfortunately. And uh, I'll explain what I mean about that in a moment. But this has led to some ongoing uh, concern and advocacy uh, by community organizations, importantly by people living with HIV, but also from scientific experts who have increasingly over the years in various jurisdictions, including Canada, uh, spoken out and said that we have real concerns about how the criminal legal system in many cases is not actually being informed by the science that we have and overextending the ambit of the criminal law, at least from the perspective of the science that we have about HIV. There are indeed impor other important reasons uh, to be concerned about the overextension of the criminal law. That is an important one, uh, that it is not in touch with the best available scientific consensus. So in Canada at the moment, where we now stand uh, is that it is reasonably settled as a result of a number of different court uh, decisions in different jurisdictions and the adoption in some jurisdictions in Canada of prosecutorial policy that it is pretty unlikely uh, that you would be prosecuted and highly unlikely that you would be convicted for allegedly not disclosing your HIV positive status to a sexual partner if at the time of that sexual encounter you had a suppressed or an undetectable viral. That seems to have been finally accepted by prosecutors for the most part and courts as a situation in which there is no realistic possibility of transmitting HIV to a sexual partner. And that's very solidly based in the science, and there's well-established scientific consensus on this point, uh, that someone who has a suppressed viral load uh, does not transmit HIV sexually. And so the significant or the realistic possibility of transmission test would not be met in that case, and that's been accepted. Uh, it has also been accepted, including by the Supreme Court of Canada, that if someone has not a suppressed viral load, which is normally defined as being under 200 copies uh, of HIV per milliliter of blood, but rather a low viral load, so a viral load that is somewhat higher than suppressed, but still low, and the person uh, or their partner, depending on who's wearing it, uh, uses a condom for uh, penetrative sex, so the anal or vaginal sex, in that circumstance, uh, there would be no realistic possibility of HIV being transmitted, and therefore no duty to disclose, and therefore you haven't committed a fraud if you do not disclose, and therefore you haven't committed the offense of aggravated sexual assault. Uh, 
Uh, beyond that, things are actually murkier. And actually, there are some recent troubling signs. So a uh, situation where someone uh, uses a condom, for example, but does not disclose their status to a sexual partner, uh, we had hoped would be recognized by the courts as a situation in which there isn't a realistic possibility of transmission for the purposes of triggering criminal sanctions, and therefore someone would not be convicted if they did not disclose their status to a sexual partner. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, although we had some incurring, we had at least one encouraging decision from Nova Scotia, a trial court decision a couple of years ago, and a suggestion from the Supreme Court of Canada in its first case on this in 1998, the Courier case, that condom use might or would uh, be sufficient to reduce the risk enough that there'd be no longer a duty to disclose. Uh, that, in fact, is not where the law uh, has currently settled at this point, and it remains unsettled. And most worryingly, uh, just a couple of years ago, the Ontario Court of Appeal, in the first appellate court decision to address this point, uh, since short of the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, actually expressly affirmed that no, using a condom is not sufficient on its own. Uh, in a case in which there was no dispute that a condom had been used by the accused person, there was no allegation by the Crown that the condom had not been used properly or had broken, uh, and there was no allegation that the accused person had actually transmitted HIV to their sexual partner, and yet the Ontario Court of Appeal, in a rather, I would say, inflexible and rigid of the framework as articulated by the Supreme Court, said, no, we think this is sufficient to actually uphold a conviction for aggravated sexual assault. Keep in mind, these were consensual sexual encounters, but for the allegation of not disclosing your HIV status, and there was condom use and no allegation of transmission. And we know uh, from decades of experience and the scientific consensus is that in that circumstance, the risk of HIV transmission would be negligible at most, and we're talking exceedingly, exceedingly small, like infinitesimal, or zero. Uh, so, and yet, the Ontario Court of Appeal thought that this was an appropriate case in which to actually convict someone for non-disclosure. And so that person you know, is spending years in prison uh, for aggravated sexual assault. Um, with respect to the question of oral sex, again, we had some encouraging uh, decisions along the way, not very many, including, again, a decision from a trial court in Nova Scotia, suggesting that in that circumstance, uh, there was a sufficient risk of, of HIV transmission, and so there was no crime in not disclosing your status. Again, the Ontario Court of Appeal, unfortunately, in a more recent decision uh, just earlier this year, has again um, disappointed the hopes of activists who had hoped that we might at least rein in the criminal law on this front, and has in fact gone out of its way to say oral sex alone without disclosure could, in the right circumstances, be a sufficient basis for convicting someone for allegedly not disclosing. Uh, even though, again, the scientific consensus is that the risk of transmission in that circumstance is effectively zero, um, it's so close to zero as to be effectively zero, um, absent some very exceptional circumstances. So this is what I, this is what I'm referring to, or these examples of what I'm referring to when I say the criminal, the courts have cast the net of criminalization really, really widely here. And the more they do that, the more they give rise to the harms of criminalization, because the less you actually tie criminalization to uh, harm or a serious risk of harm, the more you're actually criminalizing people just for being HIV positive and not disclosing that fact. So this gives rise to one of the many concerns about HIV criminalization. And we can talk about what some of the others are. And I know Alex is going to touch upon some of those as well. So there's been a lot of advocacy. I'll just say a couple of words about what that advocacy has involved and where it's gotten us to and where things stand now in terms of trying to change the scope of the law. Uh, in a number of these court cases that have arisen, uh, there have been community organizations like the one I used to had and still do work with uh, to support uh, accused persons and their defense lawyers in making sure that they are equipped with good arguments, with the best available science, connections to experts whose testimony is going to be really key, given that so much of the scope of criminal liability depends on how this test of realist of transmission is going to be interpreted, which requires resort, obviously, to scientific evidence. 
Uh, and that has had some effect, although as I've just outlined, the results have been decidedly mixed. You know, there have there have been these sort of rhetorical recognitions that, well, there shouldn't be a blanket obligation to disclose, even though a number of provincial attorneys general over the years have gone to court arguing precisely that. Those have been rebuffed. Uh, but in terms of actually limiting the scope of criminalization in a real meaningful way, really the major success has been in getting courts to recognize the science of undetectable equals untransmittable. So someone who has an undetectable or suppressed viral load does not transmit HIV sexually, therefore this threshold for triggering criminal liability uh, is not met. That's been mostly it. There has also been an effort to get uh, policy updated in a number of jurisdictions across Canada, uh, policy to which prosecutors are supposed to have in deciding in any given case whether to actually proceed with a prosecution. And uh, this also has been important uh, and there's been some success, but again, it's been, the results have been mixed. Three jurisdictions in Canada now have formal policy in place. Uh, the most significant and furthest reaching one is at the federal level, a directive that the federal attorney general issued to the Public Prosecution Service of Canada in 2018, uh, in which they said there shall be no prosecutions uh, in those places where prosec federal prosecutors handle them uh, for in the case where someone has a suppressed or an undetectable viral load, full stop. That's good. It's really just recognizing what the science already tells us. Uh, there was a suggestion uh, or, or a statement in the directive that, that, there, that there should generally be no prosecutions in cases where someone has used a condom, for example, or someone is on antiretroviral treatment, which would then lower their viral load, um, or only engaged in oral sex, absent exceptional circumstances. So that's good, but it's not really a sort of a categorical ruling out of criminal prosecutions in those circumstances, which is what would be preferable amongst other limits. In BC and Ontario, there is also policy in place from their prosecuting authorities uh, that is goes at least as far as saying someone with a suppressed viral load uh, will not be prosecuted for not disclosing. But that's pretty much uh, all that you can say definitively about their policies. The BC policy does suggest that the fact that someone uses a condom may be a factor to be considered by the prosecution in determining whether it's in the public interest in a given case to pursue a prosecution. That's obviously one of the key, two key tests that, that uh, a prosecutor has to consider in each case. But that's about as far as it goes. And so people living with HIV are left in this still murky legal terrain with the threat of criminalization hanging uh, so through those different avenues, we've achieved as advocates uh, some successes, but they are limited. And it's become increasingly clear, especially with the two recent Ontario Court of Appeal decisions that I mentioned uh, about condoms and about oral sex, that it is not likely that the courts and prosecutors are able or willing to get us out of the mess into which the uh, years of accretion of prosecutorial and court decisions, including from the Supreme Court, have gotten us. And therefore, if we really want to get to the root of this problem here, we need to actually change the underlying law. So the courts have interpreted things in the criminal code in certain ways and defined some parameters far too broadly in the view of uh, those of us who are concerned about this. And so it is now up to Parliament uh, as part of the ongoing dialogue between Parliament and the courts to actually step in and remedy this and reform the law. And so there has been a coalition uh, for a number of years called the Canadian Coalition to Reform HIV Criminalization, uh, of which Alex is the chair of the steering committee, and he can say more about that in a moment, um, and of which the HIV Legal Network is a member that has been advocating for reform to the criminal code. And earlier, I was going to say earlier this year, but last year, a few months ago, uh, the uh, government of Canada, the federal justice minister, announced consultations uh, about possible criminal code reform and the coalition and others have uh, been participating in that consultation and making our recommendations about what changes might be needed to the code to actually limit the criminal law to a much more uh, appropriate and very limited set of circumstances. Uh, the gist of which is to uh, prevent the end of uh, the use of sexual assault charges as an inappropriate tool for criminalizing HIV non-disclosure for a whole bunch of reasons and to limit any use of any criminal provisions uh, to cases where there is actual 
transmission of uh, HIV, and there has been uh, transmission with, uh, there's been action with the purpose of transmitting uh, HIV. Uh, so to set the bar much, much higher, uh, that would capture only a very uh, few and quite rare uh, set of circumstances. That's uh, where things stand at the moment, and we will see if 2023 brings any sort of efforts to actually introduce amendments to the criminal code. And I hope that gives you a sort of summary, if somewhat whirlwind, overview of the state of law and policy in Canada and some of the current advocacy. I'm happy to expand on any of those points in the comments to follow, but I should turn it over now to Alex to fill in more of the picture. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, yes, I did present uh, my research at the uh, um, House of Commons Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights alongside Richard um, and many other amazing people who were part of the Canadian Coalition to Reform HIV Criminalization. And if you're interested to see our testimony, you can see it all here on the multiple days. Uh, but there was over 30 witnesses who uh, presented um, and helped inform that process. Um, I'll say up front, I am not a lawyer. I am a activist and criminologist. I come at this work uh, from a different perspective, and I always value deeply being able to present alongside uh, Richard and other lawyers that I work with um, to provide the technical uh, expertise and uh, the legal um, uh, legal expertise needed. Um, I um, I'm going to be presenting briefly on my um, doctoral research, and I'll just present a link here to a booklet that I've made that provides outcomes of it for those of you that are interested in, in it um, and want to know more. Um, and I think Richard really just gave us a, a really excellent overview of what the picture looks like um, uh, legally. And my work has tried to kind of understand how those laws are embodied by people and how, uh, what law means on the ground for those it impacts um, and what are the actual impacts. Um, for many years, we have known that uh, HIV criminalization has deterred people um, have, uh, from testing, H for testing, uh, for HIV testing, accessing counseling and support has created a chill in relation to people living with HIV accessing services, but also other people from getting HIV testing. Um, but we haven't really known, or we hadn't known previously to some of the work that I've done, um, what are the impacts on people who've actually been charged and what are the experiences of people um, who have been prosecuted uh, in relation to this? And so I went across the country and interviewed uh, 18 different people um, who have experienced um, either were threatened with charges because we know in a context of ongoing uh, intimate partner violence and um, dis disproportionate power relationships between men and women in relationships that HIV uh, criminalization or the specter of HIV criminalization can be brought forward in, the, in those relationships and used um, as a coercive means against women and threaten, uh, to threaten them with potential criminalization. So I interviewed a number of women in, the, in those circumstances, but also talked to people who had been either charged with uh, uh, aggravated sexual assault charges, so we're in the context of an ongoing criminal trial, um, or had served their time um, and were uh, prosecuted and uh, subsequently uh, registered as sex offenders. Um, and so I spoke to them about the law uh, and their experiences being criminalized from their own perspectives. So often they had different understandings of what happened to them than the specifics of the law itself. Um, and they were just have an embodied understanding of what happened to them and talk to them about their lived experiences. I kind of uh, often note that, um, or often noted that, you know, though we don't get to hear the voices and experiences of criminalized people that often, um, specifically people living with HIV and anyone else criminalized, um, the criminal justice system produces a dichotomous narrative of either victim or perpetrator. Um, and perpetrators don't usually, or people who are framed as perpetrators don't usually get to tell their side of the story. They lose a sense of autonomy and subjectivity and being able to speak for themselves. And in the context of HIV criminalization, all of these people I spoke with um, did not understand themselves in that way and felt very confused by the charge of aggravated sexual assault where they were framed as a, potentially a violent rapist um, who was trying to infect someone else with HIV. And nothing could be further from the truth. All of the people I spoke to specifically 
had been doing things to try and protect their partners, um, had been taking antiretroviral medications, had been following uh, 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 advice from their doctors to uh, take their medication. Um, and also, and if that wasn't possible, um, based uh, some women I know who I interviewed um, would, uh, in the context of power differentials in relationships, would try and assert the use of a condom as a way of disclosing their status or why, trying to protect their partner. But we know, you know, I mean, I don't know, I'm a gay man, but in the context of a, of a straight relationship, um, if a, a woman is the one who not doesn't get to decide to use the, the, a condom, and that's the kind of horrific outcome of the 2012 decision, is it privileges the person who can use the condom. And if a woman doesn't end up using the condom because her partner doesn't use it, um, she could be charged with aggravated sexual assault and she could be end up on the sex offender registry. And I interviewed one woman who that happened to she tried to give her partner a condom. He didn't use it. She's the one who's on the sex offender registry now. And that's the horrific outcome of that decision. Um, but there's many different impacts on people's lives as a result of HIV criminalization and um, the experience of being criminalized. And I think one of the ones that we has really come to light in the discussion of uh, speaking to people directly about their experiences is the impact of being on the sex offender registry and the impact of being uh, prosecuted with a sex offense. And so one of the uh, um, one of the uh, charge that would be known as a dirty charge in prison. And the consequence of that um, was quite horrific for people in many aspects of their lives. So first of all, their privacy would be violated in the media. There was often sensationalistic media coverage of people's stories because these stories bring up all this, uh, all this, these past moralistic attitudes about um, sex and fear of the other. Often, it's racialized men, black men, uh, in the media who are have had sex with white women. Um, and uh, although those that number of people makes up less overall in terms of the um, number of cases, um, but they make up more of the media and some uh, more of the media uh, publications on that on that issue. Um, but the um, but there's sensationalistic media, people leave access, lose access to privacy um, immediately. Um, and so often they're framed right away in the media as violent perpetrators. As a result of that, they'll lose access to all aspects of their social and civil life, um, often uh, experiencing stigma and violence in their daily life if they're out on bail. Um, people know in their neighborhoods that they are have HIV, that they're charged with these charges. Um, and um, can end up facing uh, forms of violence and stigma and discrimination in their communities. When they are incarcerated, if that does happen, the people I spoke to um, often have their privacy again violated inside because they're HIV positive um, and uh, people will wonder why they're on medication and will find out that they're charged with uh, being framed as a violent rapist, even though all of the people I spoke to understood that they had had consen consensual sex with their partners. Um, outside of two women that I spoke to who had actually been assaulted by their partners and, uh, and they were living with HIV, their partners weren't living with HIV. And as a consequence of them not disclosing their HIV status to their partner, they were charged with aggravated sexual assault and they ended up on the sex offender registry. And so we know that there's a really disproportionate impact and vulnerability created because of criminalization for women living with HIV. Uh, quite a high portion of the women living with HIV who are criminalized are Indigenous women living with HIV who have been um, subject to ongoing um, sexual violence throughout their lives um, and consequently get framed as violent perpetrators in the context of HIV non-disclosure. Um, and I think Richard brought this up in terms of like knowledge of HIV and what's kind of what's uh, what's working within courts in terms of moving things forward and um, updated scientific understandings of HIV and the scientific consensus around transmission and um, uh, uh, undetectability equaling um, non-transmission um, is, uh, is something that's being brought forward quite widely. But in the context of HIV criminalization, um, the people I spoke to, all of the people who were tasked with criminalizing them, police, courts, um, judges, sometimes even their lawyers, had very limited information about HIV at all or the risks involved. And as a result, people were coached to um, coach to plead guilty 
um, in cases where there, there was evidence that they should not have pled guilty at all, but it was just like a full on panic around HIV um, and total lack of knowledge. And that's why the, the work that um, the HIV Legal Network has been doing and the leading work that Richard's been doing around educating um, lawyers has been really, really helpful so that we can get people not to plead guilty and to fight back on these cases. Um, further consequence of criminalization um, and a kind of just an outcome in general of uh, can the Canadian prison system is people uh, face horrific violence inside as a result of their charges. Um, being incarcerated in Canada, anyone who's incarcerated is, is vulnerable to violence. Those institutions are extremely violent and um, and people are very vulnerable in that circumstance. But in the context, context of being charged with aggravated sexual assault and having HIV, the people I spoke with faced intensified forms of violence, often ending up in protective custody, which is essentially, uh, or administrative segregation, which is essentially solitary confinement. Um, and, um, uh, a couple of other things, I guess. What, um, couple of uh, many of the people I interviewed, or actually all of the people I interviewed, I should say, um, had a challenge in terms of accessing justice um, and being able to pay for uh, uh, lawyers and get expertise. When they did get expertise to uh, through uh, the legal network and stuff like that, their cases ended up uh, ending up more in a beneficial outcome. But pe people had a limited access to to justice. Really hard time getting access to the means to support themselves and represent themselves in court. Um, and all of the people I spoke to as a result of being criminalized um, had long periods of suicidal ideation and many who actually tried to kill themselves, many living today with post-traumatic stress disorder and forms of anxiety and depression as a result of, of going through the criminal justice system and being framed in this way. A number of the people a number of the people who are on the sex offender registry had to go through sex offender treatment programs um, where they had to sit in circles with other people who are on the sex offender registry who are charged with violent rapes of children and so on and had to undergo phallometric testing witnessing uh, uh, horrific videos of people being assaulted to see whether they were turned on by that. And they also had to then describe themselves, their sexual desires as pathological and shameful and a problem when they were actually just normal adult sexual desires. The only thing that happened was that they had HIV, um, but the fact that they were put in those treatment programs, they had to follow the logic of the program. Many people were told by the psychologists running those programs that they didn't fit the criteria um, to be in those programs, but to meet the standards of the Correction Service Canada to have their risk class classification lowered so they could be released, they had to um, frame themselves in a pathological way uh, within those, the context of that and the, having a charge of aggravated sexual assault and, it, and uh, being on the sex offender registry. Those are quite a number of the impacts um, of being uh, charged in relation to aggravated sexual assault and HIV non-disclosure. Um, I will say a couple of things quickly just about the, um, the work that we've been doing um, and the work that Richard mentioned um, from the um, Canadian Coalition to Form HIV, Reform HIV Criminalization. We formed in 2016 and um, um, a lot of the work that had been done prior, very leading work by Richard, who's a foundational legal analysis, like informed a lot of my work and my dissertation and a lot of other people across Canada have been uh, inspired by the work that Richard has done. Um, but prior, prior to the formation of the of the a Canadian Coalition to Reform HIV Criminalization, there wasn't a lot of work of having people's lived experience involved and having people li with lived experience of criminalization involved and at the forefront of this movement. Um, and increasingly, we've been building that capacity and working to ensure that, um, or working to uh, mobilize the leadership of some people who have ha had lived experience of criminalization to kind of lead our movement and speak uh, publicly about their experiences. Because I think in tandem with uh, legal and human rights analysis, having people's lived experience there has been really helpful in shaping um, public discourse and gaining empathy and kind of building momentum to call for why we actually need change. I think we didn't have a full understanding of the impacts of the, the harmful impacts of the sex offender registry and still we started talking to people on the sex offender registry about how harmful those impacts are. And a number of people who I uh, spoke to uh, in my study, I mean, many have gone on to continue their lives and just want to move on with things um, and actually are continually surveilled 
indefinitely for the rest of their lives on the sex offender registry with no means to get off of it. Um, and they often find that going in to check into the police station when they have to, where they have their whole body examined and they have to give information about where they live and what they're doing and where they're going, um, they find that often really triggering. They think they might be arrested again. They have a fear of going back to jail is really uh, brings back all of the kind of harm and stigma. Um, that has been there in the past. So one of the things we've been trying to do and work on is ensure that uh, we can undo the harms of the sex offender registry and move this out of the classification of being understood as a sexual uh, offense, um, because it is not that at all. Um, and uh, that's one of the work, that's some of the work that we're doing kind of with trying to call for uh, the criminal code to be reformed. But I would love to open it up for a discussion and also just to uh, chat with, um, with everyone if people have questions or with Richard and we can kind of talk further about um, anything that I missed, but also um, any uh, other developments that would be useful for people. Uh, Thanks President so much, Alex. Yes, thank you both so much. Um, I really appreciate not only uh, the education and uh, the knowledge that you have on the subject matter, but also it's very clear the passion that you have towards advocating uh, for these groups. And, and so that's very much appreciated. I just wanted to add one other thing before we open up for questions, and I should have said it in my overview, uh, the penalties that the law provides, uh, Alex alluded to, to one of them. Uh, in the case of a conviction for aggravated sexual assault, as probably many who are listening will know, the maximum penalty prescribed in the criminal code is life imprisonment. And the available data, although it's partial, that uh, I'll share in one of the links in a moment, suggests that in the case of convictions for aggravated sexual assault that are based on alleged non-disclosure of HIV, the penalties that have been imposed actually are substantially higher than in, quote, normal sexual assault cases. So what we normally think of a sexual assault of coerced or, or forced um, sex. It is also uh, the case that until very recently, uh, it was mandatory that a person convicted of that offense would be designated as a sex offender. There's been a slight loosening of that, although the full implications of it remain to be seen as a result of a Supreme Court decision. But there, uh, it's highly likely uh, still that if you are convicted of aggravated sexual assault for allegedly not disclosing, uh, you will be uh, declared or ordered to register as a sex offender. And that in the case of an aggravated sexual assault conviction is presumptively for life and for a minimum of 20 years before you can actually apply to try to get yourself off sex offender registry. Uh, and finally, if you are not a citizen of Canada and you are convicted, it is highly likely that you will be deported. Uh, as because of the interplay between the provisions of the criminal code and what the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act says about uh, expulsion or inadmissibility to Canada based on criminality or serious criminality, uh, to use the language of that act. So those are very serious consequences for engaging in consensual activity without transmitting, without intent to transmit, in some cases and circumstances where you've actually taken proactive measures to reduce the possibility of transmission, um, you know, this is, in my submission, a wild overreaction on the part of the criminal law to, um, to the conduct in question. Um, and the other thing to just note is that Justice Canada itself has recognized that certain communities are disproportionately affected by this. Uh, certainly Black men in particular are proportionately represented amongst those who have been prosecuted uh, and convicted. And as recognized by Justice Canada, uh, Indigenous women and gay men are also populations who are disproportionately affected by this because we are significantly overrepresented amongst the population of people living with HIV. So any criminal law regime that hangs over people living with HIV is also going to particularly affect those communities as well. Uh, and sentencing outcomes also seem to be uh, correlated with race as well, with Black and Indigenous persons who are convicted um, receiving stiffer sentences than white people who are convicted. So we have some systemic problems here, which is partly why we need to go to the root of the problem and just get the criminal law as much as possible out of this domain. <laughs> I should also, thanks for that, Richard, and thanks for all those, those clarifications and adding uh, to the understanding the context. I should also note that um, in talking to people about their experiences, 
one of the things like we think of this as activists or ad as advocates as a criminal law issue and it's really interesting or when you talk to people not interesting but you uh talking to people about their experience understand how public health law and criminal law intersect and can reinforce each other and so one of the concerns i guess that i have as we move forward with reforms is that we might default to kind of uh coercive public health measures which could be equally or similarly harmful um, and so in some instances in people's um, process of criminalization they would have had a public health order enacted against them or a legal public health order and those public health orders if not followed correctly or if allegedly not followed correctly by public health officials could lead to um, police being called or or a criminal charge later not because of the public health orders themselves but um, uh, complaining or rising up higher in terms of how the charges would be elevated. And um, and uh, then in court, uh, fast past failure to uh, comply with public health orders could be used to justify uh, intensified uh, uh, treatment by the criminal criminal system. And so it's just been important to understand the intersections of public health law and criminal law combined. But we do have a question I just realized mm -hmm. for you, Richard. Richard mentioned that amending the criminal code would be one of the best ways to help this issue for a conviction to limit the circumstances. Is there any reason this kind of change hasn't happened? Is there resistance to slow wheels of bureaucracy? Yeah, great question. And it hasn't happened um, partly because I don't think that there has been any appetite on the part of decision makers to actually recognize the problem, that there is a problem, and to take steps like legislative reform to deal with it until very recently. And it remains to be seen, of course, just how much appetite there is and for just how much uh, reform. There is, there was, there was also earlier period in this ongoing struggle, a real concern that turning to parliament to intervene would not necessarily lead to better outcomes, conceivably possibly worse outcomes. Uh, one has to, I think, make uh, as good uh, an estimation as one can of what the likelihood is in a given parliamentary configuration of actually having enough support from enough MPs and then enough senators, which is a whole other matter, to actually get enacted the kinds of reforms that are needed. And for uh, quite a long period of time, there was not thought to be a that appropriate configuration in Parliament that, you know, a majority conservative government um, that was strong on, quote, law and order as it likes to portray itself, and that had shown that it was quite happy with the state of legal affairs, was not going to be a Parliament that was actually to pass the kinds of reforms that are needed. In more recent years, there seems to have been a growing recognition, at least in some quarters, uh, including on the part of the current justice minister, that there is a problem. Uh, and his predecessor as attorney general and minister of justice was, uh, you know, got the ball rolling uh, when she issued a directive to the, the PPSC, the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, and, uh, you know, issued a report from Justice Canada basically saying we have a problem here and something needs to be done. Uh, so a couple of years ago, the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights uh, in the House of Commons uh, did a study, and uh, as you've heard mentioned already, and made a number of recommendations, including recognizing that there is a need for law reform here. So that also, I think, helps get us closer to that ultimate goal. Um, there will, st and, and, and frankly, underlying a lot of this, of course, is unexamined HIV stigma. Um, it is still the case that I would suggest, based on my experience of speaking about this over many, many years, that the large majority of people will say, but of course someone with HIV should disclose. I have a right to know if my partner has HIV. It's on a really basic level. It's that kind of simplistic assumption and often reinforced by a lack of good information about HIV and how it's transmitted and not. That is you know, the initial stumbling block here. And that can be said of parliamentarians and policymakers just like everyone else. Um, so that is a big hurdle to overcome. But I think through some of the work that's been done by advocates, through some of the research um, that's been done by people like Alex to document the full range of harms, uh, and the fact that scientists have also started to speak out and say, we're really concerned that the criminal legal system is just not in tune with the science here. 
uh, that a number of uh, feminist legal academics and women's rights advocates have also been very critical for a whole bunch of reasons about the use of sexual assault law to, to prosecute allegations of non-disclosure. I think those things are starting to come together and the conditions may be aligning for some possible reform, but may. And I'm going to be really caveating that all over the place because we're just in a process of the government doing some consultation and there's a lot of work still to be done between them hearing concerns from people and then being willing to actually draft legislative amendments that are robust and that will properly limit the law and then actually getting those through the parliamentary process so there's you know we're not uh, we're not there yet by any means but we, we're closer than we've ever been before in 25 plus years of advocacy on this issue Thank you for that, Richard. Um, I think uh, just along the same vein here, we have another question in the chat um, just asking about the status of advocacy efforts in Parliament, which I think uh, you just touched on as well. Um, but perhaps if you could uh, discuss any of uh, the advocacy groups and their ability to influence the prosecutorial policy um, that was also tacked on to the question as well. I mean, I would take, yeah, take that one. I mean, yeah, a little bit, sure. I mean, you've been involved more in calling for prosecutorial guidance, which has a, been a strategy that's been uh, called for for many, many years and been pushed for in Ontario specifically, um, and uh, primarily by lawyers initially, but also then before the the um, Canadian Coalition to Reform HIV Criminalization came about. Um, but I would definitely say that advocacy groups have the ability to influence prosecutorial policy over time. I mean, I think in terms of the change that happened on in Ontario, that was a pretty groundbreaking one. That was hap that happened as a result of over 800 people mailing letters to the um, uh, to the Attorney General's office, um, having multiple protests at the Attorney General's office, having a petition to the Attorney, Attorney General's office, multiple op-eds, multiple news articles, many experts leading and calling for change. And so consistent and constant pushing does work over time, slowly, <laughs> in certain ways. Um, the change doesn't always end up being the one you want it to be necessarily, but um, yes, I think would say, Sophie, that um, advocacy groups do have the ability to influence policy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we formed our coalition in 2016. We're connected to an uh, international network of organizations working to counter HIV criminalization around the world. I'm on the global advisory panel of the HIV Justice Network in Europe, uh, which is a global network. And Richard, you're on the steering... The chair of the board, the supervisor. Chair, chair of the board, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> But uh, one of the, we actually formed our coalition at the HIV is not a crime conference in the US, uh, which is a leading conference in North America on movements and specifically leading uh, in the US around uh, different states working to counter and repeal HIV criminalization legislation. Um, and so that work and being connected to global movements where you've seen people repeal harmful laws, those are HIV specific laws, which is very different than what we'd be advocating for in Canada. We don't want to repeal uh, aggravated sexual assault from the criminal code. We want to change how it's being interpreted and that it can't be uh, limit the scope so that it can't be applied to HIV criminalization cases. But being connected to those movements and experts around the world, we've seen that advocacy groups can influence policy and can change policy. There's been numerous states in the U.S. where movements of people living with HIV and legal experts and advocates have mobilized for change and have gotten uh, laws either to be modernized um, or repealed, harmful laws to be repealed, and being connected to those movements has really influenced our work as the Canadian Coalition. And so one of the things we did strategically is form this coalition, which is uh, across Canada involving human rights experts, legal experts, people on the ground who've been criminalized, people who work in HIV organizations all together who can speak with one voice about what we want. So in advance of the government's consultation that just took place and just ended, the Minister of Justice's consultation, we conducted our own consultation. Um, 
which involved many, many people living with HIV and experts around across Canada who informed us on what they want to see as a path forward. And you can see the report and the outcomes of our consultation online. And we've used that to create a platform to call for change, which is what we're pushing for um, in the current uh, consultation process. And so um, being coordinated with advocacy groups can lead to change. And hopefully I'm cautiously optimistic around the uh, outcomes of the uh, consultation. We'll see. We have to be really, really cautious about what could happen and also um, whatever um, uh, gets uh, drafted could end up changing in multiple different ways once it's out in the world. And we have to be really careful about how we move forward, but um, uh, have cautious optimism about it all. So we have about four-ish minutes left. Um, something that I've been curious about, so I'm gonna be a little bit selfish and ask a question of my own here. I've just been curious if there's been any efforts to approach this from a charter perspective. Um, I know you've mentioned the human rights side, but I'm just curious about that side of it. Sure, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. We, so, so the HIV Legal Network and some other organizations like the HIV Legal, AIDS Legal Clinic in Ontario and an organization called Coxida in Quebec that has an HIV and human rights program, um, along with a number of organizations of people living with HIV and frontline ASOs, AIDS service organizations, uh, in various configurations have intervened in some of uh, appellate proceedings over the years, including at the Supreme Court of Canada. And in those submissions, we have, depending on the facts of the case and you know the, the space we have as interveners um, to you know for our written submissions and our oral submissions, have specifically spoken about the charter concerns that are raised by overly broad criminalization of HIV, and in particular, um, questions of equality and non-discrimination under Section 15 of the Charter. So as I said in my remarks at the beginning, the wider you cast the net of HIV criminalization, the more you're approaching just criminalizing people for living with HIV and having sex, uh, not because you're actually tying the application of the criminal law to actual harm or actual serious risk of serious harm, which ought to be you know, a fairly high bar before you start deploying the criminal law against people. Uh, and so we've, ma we've made that point amongst others uh, in our submissions as one of the uh, you know, public policy arguments basically about why HIV criminalization as it currently stands is too broad and should be reined in. We haven't spent, we haven't put a huge focus on that argument uh, in part because some of the exchange with courts from the early years, the judges from the bench including during the Courier hearing in the Supreme Court of Canada in 1998, uh, suggested that that argument wasn't one that was gonna gain a lot of traction. And so you want to be strategic as an advocate, of course, when you're going in front of the court and you have your five or maybe 10 minutes to make your oral submissions and you have X number of pages in your written submissions, you really wanna focus on the things that you think are gonna be the stronger arguments and are going to persuade the court to adopt the position that you're putting forward. That does not seem and has not seemed would be one of those arguments, unfortunately. That's why we have not put too many eggs in that basket, and we've advanced a whole range of other arguments about why the law should be limited in various ways. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that the fact that we have uh, data showing disproportionate impact on certain populations that I mentioned, and that Justice Canada's own report has recognized that, you know, also gives rise to other aspects of equality concerns. So not just based on HIV status, but certainly sexual orientation and, and race. Uh, but again, I, I'm not super confident that the courts are going to care about that enough, frankly, to have it serve as sufficient basis, certainly not on its own, to actually have the courts resile from the fairly broad net that they've cast so far and say, okay, we're dialing this back, we got it wrong, we realize that now, and here's a much more limited legal framework that you should apply. I, I think once that damage is done, you know, the horse is bolted, the cat is out of the bag, and the court, the court, the Supreme Court and lower courts are just not able or willing to deal with this. They've been given multiple opportunities, including the Ontario Court of Appeal, and frankly, they've screwed it up more often than they haven't, than they've gotten it right. Uh, 
So I don't think applying a charter argument here is, is going to get us very far, unfortunately. Sorry to be cynical, but <laughs> one might call yeah. it realistic too. <laughs> no, absolutely. That makes sense. Um, so it looks like we're at time here. Um, I just wanted to give another huge thank you to you both for joining us today. Um, it looked like our, our chat was busy. Um, we had some interested listeners today. Um, and for anyone um, who wasn't able to watch, this recording will be posted on our social media and shared within the next couple of days. Um, also, if anyone watching um, has any questions for our panelists specifically, um, you can send them to uh, our email, dclsa at hotmail.com, and I will try to connect you uh, to our panelists. And Sierra, I'll flip you a Word document that has links to some of the things I shared and that Alex shared and a few other items as well that you might want to share with, with people. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard. All right. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks right. for having us. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Take care, everyone.